Hello, dear friends. Welcome to another reading from the book entitled Godhead Theology, subtitled Modalism, the Original Orthodoxy. Hello, I am Bishop Jerry Hayes. I am Abbot General of the Apostolic Disciples of the Way, and we have been doing a series of readings from uh, my book, Godhead Theology. We have been in chapter 18 for the last uh, three uh, videos. This is the fourth video on that particular chapter, chapter 18, entitled The Sun. Now, the other videos have been anywhere from 20 to four, uh, anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. This one is going to be considerably shorter because we are right at the end of uh, this chapter. And we're going to be dealing with only one creedal statement. So uh, I'm going to get right to it and uh, right after we pray. All right. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness and on our minds that we might perceive truth and on our hearts that we might believe truth and anoint our lips that we might speak truth with clarity and conviction. In Jesus' name we pray, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. One God, world without end. Amen. So now we're going to go right to our reading. Now, this is a paragraph. What we're doing in, in this particular uh, part of the book, Godhead Theology, is we are going line by line through the uh, Apostolic Creed. The Apostolic Creed has five paragraphs, and um, we are in the second paragraph. The first three paragraphs are uh, Christological. And uh, the uh, fourth paragraph is on soteriology. And the fifth paragraph is sort of a, a concluding, summarizing paragraph of all of the uh, Oneness Pentecostal uh, points of doctrine. The Apostolic Creed is a codification of Oneness Pentecostalism as it exists in the 20th and the 21st centuries. We like to say modalistic monarchianism. So we're going to go right to line 21 at this time. And line 21 is the final line of the second paragraph on the Son of God. The second paragraph deals with the Son. It says, Thereby, and because of generation and redemption, reasonably termed the Son of God. Let me read it again so that we know what we're talking about. Thereby, and because of generation and redemption, reasonably termed the Son of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, we read, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. New American Standard Bible. John 3.16 reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 reads, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Now I might say before we get any further into explaining this 21st line of the creed, thereby and because of generation and redemption reasonably termed the Son of God, I might say this. It is not proper to say the Son is the Father. But it is proper to say, he who became the Son is the Father. 
The word thereby is in consideration of all that has gone before in this paragraph of the creed. One, the manifestation in the flesh of God Almighty. Two, the conception caused by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. Three, the birth from the Virgin Mary. Four, the incarnation of God and man consubstantiated in one person. Five, the name Jesus, meaning Yahweh Savior. Six, homoousius of Christ to the Father. And seven, the homoousius of Christ with humans. All of this has come before in this paragraph. So our line 21 starts out by saying thereby. So it takes all of this information into account and says, considering all of this, thereby. <laughs> when we consider Jesus being the Son of God because of his generation, we have the event of God himself being birthed into our world through the matrix of a woman's womb. The Greek New Testament renders John 1.18 thusly, monogenes theos. Here John calls Jesus monogenes theos. English, only are the uniquely begotten God. Now, in this case, it is the incarnated God that is called the Son because of his having undergone generation. Therefore, in this sense, it is not the humanity of Christ alone that the Scripture designates as the Son, but it is the God-man as he is in himself. It is in this sense that the ancient monarchians viewed the Son of God as God. In this writer's opinion, this definition must be allowed because of the weight of manuscript evidence for the Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 18. To confirm this view, one is reminded of the use of the phrase son of. One is said to be the son of whatever he exemplifies or manifests. One who dwells in the desert is said to be a son of the desert. Also in this way, the brothers James and John were surnamed Bo and Nergis. The apostles, uh, sons of thunder, <laughs> Bo Nergis, sons of thunder, Mark chapter 3 and verse 17. And Joseph's name was changed by the apostles to Barnabas, son of consolation. Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. Thus, these persons were understood to be, the, uh, to be the very nature, to be the very character or essence of what they were the sons of. Understanding this helps us comprehend the encounter between Jesus and the Jews in John chapter 10, where Jesus had said that he and the Father were one. The Jews then took up stones to stone him. Jesus asked them for what good work they were preparing to stone him. They said clearly, quote, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. End quote. John chapter 10 and verse 33. Jesus then, in his defense, said, quote, You say I blaspheme because I said I am the Son of God? End quote. To the Jews then, Jesus had called himself God because he said that he was the Son of God. As one is the Son of the desert, or sons of thunder, or the Son of consolation. Jesus was the Son of God. He embodied all that was God the Father. 
John 10 and verse 30 and following uh, verses. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And also Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. This then makes Peter's confession more powerful than we ever knew when he proclaimed, quote, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, end quote. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. In fairness, it should be pointed out, however, that the Textus Receptus reads ho monogenes weas, or uh, the only uniquely begotten Son. Now, the Son is, it is argued, is limited to his humanity and is inferior to the Father, as the term Son would imply. Now, I understand that concept, but acknowledge that it does not answer the best Greek manuscript evidence of John 1.18, monogenes theos, only uniquely begotten God. Oneness adherents of the 20th and 21st centuries have a proclivity to view the Son of God as limited only to the humanity of Christ. This, of course, aids in fielding the queries concerning the differences demonstrated between Jesus as God and Jesus as man. In a very particular way, this is true. However, one cannot disallow the God-man concept of the Son in a very general manner. The New Testament seems to use the term Son in two very different ways. One who embodies and reflects the character, even the very essence of someone or something, and one who is the offspring of another. We must depend, therefore, on the context to sort out the proper application of the term Son of God. Another consideration for the title of Son is because of redemption. In order to facilitate redemption, it was obligatory that the Savior be at once God and man. In this sense, he held the position of federal head of both families. The God Jesus is often referred to as the Son of God, and the man Jesus as the Son of Man. The glory with which Jesus prayed to be glorified, recorded in John chapter 17 and verse 5, was the preordained works of redemption, namely his passion, shedding his blood for the redemption of mankind, and resurrection. This he would only accomplish as the incarnated God-man. The glory of the passion in his humanity, the cutting of the blood covenant by the shedding of blood of both God and man, and the glory of his resurrection in his deity. Jesus told Martha, the sister of Mary and Lazarus, that he was the resurrection and the life. Paul wrote that he alone, Jesus, has immortality. Further, only in the incarnation was the blood of God shed. Acts 20 and verse 28. In this sense, the sonship of the God-man is manifest. It then is established that the sonship of Jesus Christ embraces both natures of God and man. Now we may conclude with this statement. One should not think it strange that the Father became his own son when he accomplished the feat of himself coming among his creation in a physical form through the Incarnation as that incarnation was accomplished 
through generation in a woman's womb. Therefore, we may say straightforwardly that by the father himself undergoing generation, he became his own son. Thus, we are brought into agreement with John 1 and 18, as that passage references Mary's baby as, quote, the only uniquely begotten God. This brings us to the conclusion of our uh, third paragraph of the Apostolic Creed that deals with the Son of God. I trust that uh, you have enjoyed this reading. It's been a short one compared to most of our readings. And uh, it was taken from the 18th chapter of Godhead Theology. This book is subtitled Modalism, the Original Orthodoxy. And uh, I want to encourage you to get your personal copy of this book. You can order it from Amazon.com Books. And just up in the banner window, search Godhead Theology, Bishop Jerry Hayes. And you can have this book in your hands in a matter of just a few days. The Lord bless you, friends. And it is my prayer that our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, sanctify you wholly in mind, body, soul, and spirit. The Lord bless until we are together again.